service. Thank you. If you have a, your Bibles, get them out, and uh, we're going to go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And I want to read the first ten verses of Ephesians, chapter 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler who exercises authority over the lower heavens, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath, as, as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with the Messiah, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Together with Jesus Christ, he also raised us up and seated us in the heavens, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time so that we should walk in them. Now this is the fourth sermon in our series on grace. If you remember, our primary text for the series is, is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For you're saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. Now, I've started every sermon by saying this. Grace is the most important concept in the Bible, in Christianity, and in the world. And it's clearly, most clearly expressed in the promises of God revealed in Scripture and embodied in Jesus Christ himself. Now, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary definition of grace is unmerited divine, divine assistance given humans for their regeneration or sanctification, a virtue coming from God, or a state of sanctification enjoyed through divine grace. The definition I gave you from the New American Standard New Testament Greek lexicon is this, goodwill, loving kindness, favor, the merciful kindness by which God, ex exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to the exercise of the Christian virtues. Also remember this, you remember this, the Greeks used the word charis, if I think I pronounced that right, it's pronounced, I guess, like charis, uh, it's spelled C-H-A-R-I-S. Now that's, that's translated into English as grace. And the Greeks use this word to describe favor shown to a friend. When Jesus came and died on the cross, grace changed from being an expression only to friends, as the Greeks describe it, to include not only friends, but enemies as well. Now last week, I identified six forms of grace. They were common grace, which is the kindness or favor God gives to all mankind, believer or not. Okay, and the scripture reference for that was, was Matthew chapter five, verse 45, that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So common grace and common grace, the saving grace, which is the provision of salvation through Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8 says, We have redemption in him through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Then that's securing grace, which is the favor, that God, favor of God by which Christians are kept secure in spite of sin. In spite of sin, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Then there's sanctifying grace, 
Sanctifying grace works within the believer, causing them or us to grow and mature and progress, becoming more Christ-like. The script in Romans chapter 8, verse, verses 28 and 29. For we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Those are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be firstborn among many brothers. And that's serving grace. Uh, the spiritual gifts that we talk about. Spiritual gifts that believers have been given by the Holy Spirit. Those are serving graces. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 10 says, As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Then there is sustaining grace. The grace is given at special times of need, especially during adversity or suffering. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, we all know about Paul warning whatever it was that was bothering him, removed, and he asked God to do it three times, and God's response was, and he said to me, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So God's grace sustains us. Now today, I want to talk about the nature of God's grace. There's a guy named uh, J.J. J. I. Packer who describes grace this way. In the New Testament, grace means God's love in action towards men who merited the opposite of love. Grace means God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. Grace means God sent his only son to the cross so that we guilty ones might be reconciled to God and received into heaven. Now, to make even the slightest contribution to our salvation, if we make even the slightest contribution to our salvation, it nullifies grace. Because first of all, we're going to exaggerate our contribution. It's going to be something we have done to receive grace, and not, that's not God's grace. It's a gift. It's unmerited, and it didn't cost, doesn't cost us anything, but it does cost. And we're going to talk about that. Now we're going to talk about the, 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 the nature of grace today. That's what I want to talk about today, the nature of grace. First of all, grace is undeserved. By definition, it's unmerited, so you can't work to earn it. It's a gift from God. Now, when you break man's laws, you pay man's penalty. When you break God's laws, you pay God's penalty. God's penalty for sin or breaking his laws is, is eternity in hell, it's death. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So somebody has to pay for all the things you've done in life that hurt other people, hurt yourself, and you hurt God. And hurt God. Well, God's plan, he had a plan, and his plan is described in John three sixteen. We all know that verse. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In other words, he said, I'll send my son Jesus to pay the penalty. He will take your place so you don't have to go to hell. You can be with me forever. Now that means that everything you've ever done or will ever do wrong in life has already been paid for by Jesus Christ on the cross. Through Jesus, you have been made right with God. In Titus chapter 3, verses 5 through 7, here's what it says. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, which he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, 
that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of glory. And as our text says, remember what our text says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now to benefit from this gift, we have to accept it, and we accept this gift by faith. We have to believe and acknowledge that Jesus gave the gift. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 10. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So first of all, grace is totally undeserved. Okay? That's part of the nature of grace. Number two, grace is given to the humble. Now when Jesus came to the earth, he came to minister to the poor, the suffering, and the needy. He came to minister to those who were in need and knew it. When Jesus chose to associate with the needy rather than the elite of his day, it greatly offended the Jewish lead leaders. Mark chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 say, And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. James, and James chapter 4 verse 6 says, But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 5 says, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility, for God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Also, grace can never be an excuse to sin. Grace can never be an excuse to sin. Just because God has given us grace through Jesus to cover all of our past, present, and future sin, it doesn't give us the license to sin. That actually makes no sense at all. Romans chapter 6 verses uh, 1 and 2 says this. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. And is why not? How shall we who died to sin live in sin any longer? We died to sin so we can't casually and carelessly continue to sin. That's inconsistent with our new life in Christ. Grace is God's presence to do only what he can do through Christ's finished work on the cross. I said this, I've said this before, grace is really the thing that produces and, and empowers righteousness. Romans chapter 5, verse, I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture, but so write it down and read it and study it. Romans chapter 5, verse 20 says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were, but as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So, we cannot, grace is not a license to sin. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So, if you've been saved by grace, we shouldn't cast, now we do sin, 
but we shouldn't casually and consistently sin because it's inconsistent with the new creature we have become. Now grace is always in harmony with God's other attributes. It's, it's possible to misunderstand the grace of God by thinking that somehow uh, grace is somehow granted at the expense of God's holiness or at the expense of God's justice. Grace does not set aside the requirements of justice, it just satisfies them. Grace does not set aside the requirements of justice, it just satisfies them. The Christian is no longer guilty before God and need not stand under condemnation for sin, but somebody had to pay the penalty for sin. For the Christian, that person is our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to read something from you. I want to read Romans chapter 3, verses 24 through 26, but I'm going to read it from the Amplified Bible. Romans 3, 24 through 26. And are being justified, that's declared free from the guilt of sin, made acceptable to God, and granted eternal life as a gift by his precious, undeserved grace through the redemption, the payment for sin, which is provided in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly before the eyes of the world as a life-giving sacrifice of atonement and reconciliation by his blood to be received through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness which demands punishment for sin because in his forbearance he did his deliberate restraint he passed over the sins previously committed before Jesus' crucifixion. It was to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus and would die confidently on him as Savior. Grace then meets the demands of justice and holiness. It does not set them aside. Grace, again, grace is never granted at the expense of God's justice. Someone has to pay, but Christ did pay. The only way, another, one of the, another part of the nature of God is the only way you can receive his saving grace is through Jesus. The only way you can receive God's saving grace is through Jesus. Now, it's no secret that grace is available to everybody, but only through Jesus. I want to read uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, again from the Amplified Bible. To the praise of his glorious grace and favor, which he so freely bestowed on us in the beloved, his Son, Jesus Christ. In him we have redemption, that is, our deliverance and salvation through his blood, which paid the penalty for our sin and resulted in the forgiveness and complete pardon of our sin, in accordance with the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and understanding with practical insight. Now remember John 3, 16? I want to read it again, but I want to read it now from the Amplified Bible, and I'm going to start with verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the desert on a pole, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross that whosoever believes in him will have eternal life after physical death and will surely live forever. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten Son, so on whomever believes and trusts in him as Savior shall not perish but have eternal life. God's grace has also appeared to all men. All God's promises and saving work from the time that he created man are wrapped up in his grace. All of his blessings and gifts have been designed to lead men to repentance and salvation. 
Titus chapter 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Well, I read the uh, scripture earlier in Matthew uh, uh, 5.45. He makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. God's grace has appeared to all men. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So God's grace has, is available for all men. As I said before, and I've said several times, grace is the source of all God's blessings. Grace is the source of all God's blessings. Grace is pure, it's never a mixture of God's actions and our efforts. Grace is never a mixture of God's and actions and our effort. Grace is entirely the work of God. Man didn't cause it, and it's completely undeserved. It doesn't matter what we've accomplished before salvation, even if it was a good thing, and it really doesn't matter what we do afterwards, it's still undeserved. Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, or, now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And Romans chapter 11, verse 6, says, And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But it is, if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. So what I'm saying is, grace has, God's saving grace has nothing to do with anything we have done or will ever do, it's totally undeserved. It's a gift from God. Grace is the, and it's the sovereign work of God. Grace is the sovereign work of God. Since we can't claim, we to have no claim on God's grace, and we can't contribute anything to it, then grace must be sovereign. Grace isn't looking for a few good men, but grace is looking for the condemned, the guilty, and the helpless. And by grace through faith, it will save, sanctify, and glorify them. Now some people have a problem with this, but again, it's God's, it's God's favor, and he gives it to whomever he wishes. You know, he has established the requirements. They're his requirements and not ours. Romans chapter 9, to, point, to make a point, Romans chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, for he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. It's God's sovereign decision. Grace is his sovereign decision. I've said this before. Grace is the source of righteousness. Now these things I've given you today are the nature of grace. Grace is the source of God's righteousness. Grace is the source of all blessings to mankind, and those blessings include righteousness. A couple of weeks ago, as a matter of fact, I said grace produces righteousness. Grace produces righteousness. While the law defines righteousness, I'm talking about the Mosaic law, if you want to read it, it's in, it's in the Old Testament, uh, Exodus through Deuteronomy. While the law defines righteousness, 
only grace delivers righteousness. The law was never intended to be a means of obtaining grace. It was given to demonstrate to men that grace was desperately needed. I'm going to read a few verses again from Romans chapter 3, verses 19 through 26. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to, to, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a perpetuation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God has passed over the sins that were previously committed and de to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who had faith. Now that's, some of that's the same scripture I read from the Amplified Version. <coughs> Grace is the source of righteousness. Grace is how through Jesus Christ we have been declared righteous or made right with God. Those of us who have been saved by God's grace through faith have been made right with God. That righteousness was achieved through Jesus Christ. So when God sees us, he sees the righteousness of Christ. For us to succeed in life, in this life, we need the abundance of grace and the righteousness that God makes available. So, last week I gave you some forms of God's grace. Today I described the nature of grace. But the bottom line of all of this is this, that God, because he loves us, so much. And because he's righteous and just, he sent his son Jesus to die in our place because there has to be a penalty. If God is God and he's just and right, there must be a penalty for sin. God sent his only son to die in our place so that we would not have to suffer the penalty for sin. Now the catch is, you have to one, believe that and confess that you are a sinner and confess that you believe that Jesus is, is, is God's son and that he came and died in our place and you will receive the grace of God, the saving grace of God. Those of us who have been saved by God's grace will live forever. We will live an eternal and everlasting life in God's presence. Those of us who've been, who have not accepted the free gift of God's grace will live forever also, but you will live outside of the presence of God. And, and, and the Bible says that in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, in that place in the Bible it talks about a lot of heat. In that place it talks about torment. So it's real simple. God has already provided the answer. And it's a gift. We, there's nothing that we can do to work for it. There's nothing we have to do to work for it. All we must do is believe it and accept it. So if there's anyone here today who can't say for sure who can't positively know that if I died today, if I died in this sanctuary, that I would forever be with Jesus Christ 
in heaven, if you can't say that today and believe that today, then perhaps you need to accept God's saving grace. And it's real simple. I read it in Romans, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. You can confess and believe. So if there's anyone here today who says, has not accepted God's gift of grace for eternal life, now is the time to do that. And I'll put it this way. If you don't want to come down here in front of everybody to do that, you can talk to me after service. And then we can, we can make sure that you will be confident that if you die today, you will be with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, forever. So if anyone here who would like to do that today, come down now. All right.